But I'm going to go quickly. Uh, last night, uh, we had a birthday party for Jesus with a group of believers in Jahanian, uh, Pakistan. I've been meeting with them online, talk about technology. Every Saturday night at about 8 o'clock, I get to talk to them and pray for them. And we're just sort of starting to get to know each other and to learn uh, how to pray for each other. And last night was a birthday party for Jesus. <laughs> and they had a cake. And after we were all done, after the ser sermon uh, message, um, they cut the cake and they took a piece of the Jesus birthday cake and gave it to one person. And then everybody clapped. Then they took another piece of cake and gave it to another person and everybody clapped. And it was precious. It was so amazing. And uh, so be praying for them. We're praying that uh, the Bibles that we have ordered from Lahore, Pakistan, 50 of them will get there. Uh, so far, uh, I'm starting to wonder about what happened to the money, what happened to the wire transfer, because it was transferred about um, on the 5th of December. And so the bank where we did the transfer said, you don't have to really start worrying about worrying until Monday, <laughs> which is tomorrow. <laughs> so I haven't started worrying yet, but it's a pretty substantial amount of money. So pray that not only that the money would get there, but that the Pakistan Bible Society would get those Bibles down to the church in Pakistan. That would be so cool. Anyway, okay. So um, I'm just so thankful that we have this book. Are you thankful for this? Amen. I mean, more than I realize the older I get. Because in here, especially, I mean, it's all the Word of God. I don't doubt any of it. But when you come to the book of Matthew and you come to the book of Mark, and you come to the book of Luke, and you come to the book of John, you have the only records, the infallible, the authoritative records that we have, uh, which tell us about the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, it is amazing. Um, the Gospels were not written to be a history they were really more intended to introduce us to the person of Jesus. Every gospel writer had a different take, uh, a different slant. Uh, Matthew, for example, was written in response to the need of a Jewish audience. In fact, when you read the book that I'm going to give you, we're going to give you, um, <laughs> it's such an amazing thing that Luis Lapidus uh, when he first eventually cracked the pages open on the New Testament, which is really hard for a Jewish believer to do. Because uh, they like to major in the Old Testament Jewish scriptures, and they're okay with that. But to start reading the New Testament is really tough. But guess what he did? He opened his New Testament, and the first thing he read was the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. And that's what cracked the door open for Luis and eventually brought him to faith in Christ. So Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience. Um, he wrote to explain not so much that Jesus is the Messiah, but since he was the promised Messiah, why the kingdom was not established. That's why he wrote. He was trying to help Jewish believers, Jewish people understand why the kingdom was not established. And he presents Jesus as the king of Israel. Then there's Mark and Luke who were not apostles. Um, they, but they consulted many of the eyewitnesses that were living at the time. And, uh, and they had written records that they could look over and that they could study carefully and they could put together the, the accounts of eyewitnesses and they could piece together and write clearly um, 
about this one named Jesus. You guys remember when you start reading the book of Luke, don't you? Luke's gospel, he began by explaining that. Um, an apostle, by the way, was basically someone who had seen the resurrected Christ. If you had not been an eyewitness to the resurrection of Christ, you were not one of those 12 apostles, the 12 that are going to be seated on the 12 thrones in the book of Revelation, uh, you know, those guys. But um, so Mark and Luke were not those apostles, but they were authors of the New Testament. And here's what Luke said, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us. So there were many who undertook to compile an account of the life of Christ and the miracles and the glory of this one named Jesus, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully. Luke was a careful investigator of all of the things pertaining to Christ. And he carefully investigated everything from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. Isn't that great? That's Luke. That is the author of the, the book of Luke and, of course, the book of Acts following that. So he, his um, goal was to present Jesus Christ as Messiah, the Son of God. So um, Luke wrote his gospel for the benefit of the Greek world. Matthew for the Jewish world. Luke for the Greek world, uh, which had been reached primarily through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So I'm going to speed up here a little bit because of time. Um, um, and then you have the book of Mark. I'm reading through the book of Mark right now. I just love to get up and spend some time. I'm in about Mark chapter 9 right now. And I love to read uh, what Mark had to say. Mark wrote primarily for the Roman world. Um, and Mark had been a, a companion of Paul and Barnabas in his missionary journeys. And the Old Testament prophets describe the Messiah as the servant of Jehovah. Read Isaiah, for example. And now in Mark was presenting Jesus Christ as the servant of Jehovah. And then finally, you have John. <laughs> and John was an apostle. He was an eyewitness. He was, he was one who spent incredible time with Jesus. He uh, lived and, and followed him and uh, absorbed uh, what Christ had to teach and who he was. And so John's goal was to present Jesus as the Savior. So if you read the book of John, you are looking at John presenting Jesus as the Savior uh, through whom men and women might believe and have eternal life. So the Gospels were primarily written for believers, people who had already come to faith in Christ. And each Gospel writer was wanting to encourage and strengthen the faith of believers at that time. And of course, uh, so John is the one that I love uh, very much because he talks about... Um, reaching people with the gospel of Christ. So look with me, if you would, uh, at John chapter 1, and I'm just going to try and be brief here, okay? So uh, this is such an amazing prologue to the gospel of John. It says, In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, in the beginning, with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That's just such an amazing concept right there, that all things came into being through Jesus. So the created world that we know was the product of his creative work. And before the first day of creation, he was. He is the eternal son. And he is uh, deity. The word was God. And, and so in him was life. And the life was the light of men. I think that as we read through the Gospels and we think about light and darkness, I've been thinking a lot about that. Darkness really has, it uh, signifies ignorance of God. If I'm in the dark, darkness is a picture of I don't know God. I don't know His ways. I don't know His character. I don't know what's ahead for me. I, I, I just don't know God. And light is the opposite of that. And the light is the knowledge of God and, and the worship of God and the glory of God. And so to me, this whole prologue is such an amazing picture because it says in, in verse 14, and the word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. We saw his glory. It's the same glory that people, that Moses saw in the tabernacle. It's the same glory that the priests saw in the temple. It's the same glory that Peter, James, and John saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. It is the Shekinah glory of God. And when Jesus came, it's as we beheld his glory. There was light that shone in the darkness. And our world which shakes its fists at God and debates against the knowledge of God, uh, needs the light of the truth of the gospel. Our world desperately needs it. I don't care whether it's in, at UCLA, on the campus of UCLA with college women. I just, if you ever go to LA, just go and there's a coffee shop right across the street from, mm -hmm. if you can stand it, Bob, I know you're a Husky fan, but you could go down to UCLA and at least check out your, the enemy down there. Um, there's a coffee shop there and they're really working at reaching out to the students at the college. Uh, it's pretty exciting, but they're bringing the light of the truth of the gospel to those who are closed those who are rejecting the truth. And so, um, or Pakistan. I'm amazed. Pakistan is a Muslim country. And yet, I don't even know how this happened. But I just started uh, a relationship with a pastor. And, and every week, you get to sing with them and pray for them. And I, I hear them sing in Pakistani and Urdu. And, and uh, it's amazing. And... and what, what we have to say here today applies to them just exactly the same. Or uh, wherever in the world that we happen to think. So uh, verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So I'm just jumping ahead here a little bit. Um, the Lord Jesus was rich and he was in heaven and he was eternally connected with the father in the trinity talk about the trinitarian formula father son and holy spirit eternally one being three persons amazing mystery but he was eternally there but then it says that he humbled himself in heaven he humbled himself he didn't come to earth and find out that he needed to be humbled he humbled himself in the glory of heaven he was rich 
He was at the Father's right hand. He was in a place of honor and glory and majesty and had no need. But it says that he humbled himself and was made in the likeness of men and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I mean, it's an amazing story of God's condescension. Isn't it? Christmas is about God humbling himself. Not being proud. Not grasping at what he wanted, but choosing to be, be made in the likeness of men so that we could be saved. So here's a picture. Some of you may, a few of you might know this story. I've been thinking about it lately. I have a friend in the Middle East and uh, many years ago, uh, he was involved in a, a ministry to college students. Let's just say it that way. And he was working and praying and trying to reach out to people in a, what we would call a closed country. Uh, a, a, a primarily Muslim country. And there were these kids and that he was trying to build a relationship with them. He was trying to, to win them and to be their friend and to care about them. And, and just like we should be, right? I mean, we are not just collectors of information. We are people who are called to go and look at people and love people and get to know people and to spend time with them. Um, so anyway, that's what my friend was doing. And one day after school, he was walking by some sort of a pool. I don't know if it was a swimming pool or just a place that collected water. I don't know, but it was dirty. It was not the kind of pool that I would want to jump into. And well, you probably wouldn't either. But guess what? There were these boys swimming in the pool. And they were having a great time. And, and then my friend walked by. And the boys in the pool invited him to jump into their pool. Come on and go swimming with us. And guess what his thoughts were in his mind? <laughs> There's no way I'm going to jump into that pool with those boys. Uh, there must be some other way to connect with them. But the Spirit of God convinced him, and he ended up jumping in the pool with them. And I know there's more to that story. I mean, sometimes we tell these stories and we think, yeah, it's just got this perfect ending. But this story really does have an amazing ending because of what happened in the lives of those boys through a friendship with someone who was a missionary. And they became friends. And those boys trusted Christ as Savior. Amen. And it was because... He was willing to jump into that filthy pool with them. And we, we may not be like that. But I want to tell you this morning, God is like that. Because God, you know, in eternity past, jumped into our filthy pool. He jumped into the pool of sin. And I don't care what country you get up in the morning and claim as your own, sin is all around us. The rebellion against God, the, the rejection of God, the rejection of God's rules, the rejection of His glory, the, the, the placing of self and, and human glory on the throne as opposed to the Creator God that we love. And so... Um, God had to come into this world to fix the only problem that keeps anyone out of heaven. There's only one problem. I don't care how good we try and be, how much effort we put into it. I don't care how much we try to please God. Jesus had to come to fix 
the one problem that keeps human beings from heaven. And that's the problem of sin. And without Jesus, we would be in the darkness forever, without hope, without forgiveness, without cleansing, without the glory of God in our life, without all that God wants to give us. So I'd like to have you turn your Bible. It's time to quit, but I'm going to give you one verse to think about as you go home today. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I said that, right? <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 8. For you know, and you can study the context of all of this, but it's clear enough to me, for you know, Corinthians, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the unmerited, the undeserved favor of God toward us. As we sit here today, and you are a believer in Christ, you should know the grace of God, the undeserved favor of God, the unmerited blessing of God toward you. It says, for you know the grace of God, Corinthians, that though he was rich, Jesus was rich. He was wealthy. He had everything. He needed nothing. It says, though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became patokos. You know what patokas means? It's Greek for poor, but destitute. It's really poor. So he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're and I'm assuming many of you are, I'm looking at a congregation of rich people. And I'm not talking about your bank account. I'm talking about your spiritual account with God. If you have trusted Christ, you are wealthy. You have been blessed. You have been forgiven. You have been given life. You have, you have purpose for getting up in the morning. You have so much uh, Lewis Berry Chafer talked about 33 blessings that he could count that belong to every believer in Christ. If you don't know what those blessings are, you're missing a lot. But let me read it again. For you know the grace of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his Poverty, you might become rich. Do you look at yourself as a rich believer in Christ? Because of Christmas? Because of the humiliation of Christ? Because of his self emptying? Because of his incarnation? Well, I hope so. We're going to listen to a song, and I hope you guys play it nice and loud. The words should be up on the screen. But to me, this song, and there's lots of good songs out there, but I like the words to this song, which really speak to how rich we are in Christ. Okay? Amen. Would you stand up and we'll pray and be dismissed, all right? Lord, we thank you today for the blood of, of our Savior Jesus. Lord, we thank you that he was the sacrifice, the lamb that was slain, the lamb of God that came uh, to deal with the problem of sin in our world. 
Lord, we uh, confess our need of Christ every day, but we thank you, Lord, for the cleansing. We thank you for the forgiveness. We thank you that you adopted us into your family. We are your sons. We are your daughters. We are your children. We are beloved by you. Lord, we have so many blessings, and uh, you have transformed us. You've cleansed us, and we have been made white in the blood of the Lamb. So, Lord, thank you for that. Uh, Lord, as we go about our week uh, in preparation for Christmas, I pray for your blessing on every single one here. Pray that you would strengthen them, bless them, give them great joy in their heart, help them to, to focus on Christ Jesus all week long, because that's what Christmas is all about. So we thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. God bless you guys.